Well, good evening and welcome to the e-commerce podcast. My name is Matt Edmondson and this is the live recording of our podcast. Yes, it is. Yes, we do this every Thursday evening, UK time. Uh, we come on here, we interview some amazing guests to do with the world of e-commerce and we just broadcast it out on YouTube, out on Facebook. So wherever you're watching, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're watching on YouTube, a big hi to you. Make sure you say hi in the comments. Um, we've got a great guest tonight. We're going to be talking to a chap called Richard St uh, schnitzel and we are getting into all things automation now uh, just to give you a heads up uh, the way this is going to work if you are new here to our live stream or if you're watching this and catch up the way it works is we record the podcast in a single take okay for a number of reasons which i won't bore you with it's just kind of how we do it here um, and so in just a few seconds i'm going to play the intro to the podcast even though i've kind of introduced myself because we cut all this bit out for the actual podcast for obvious reasons. Um, so I'm going to play the intro to the podcast. Then after that, we're going to get Richard on. We're going to talk to him about automation and how it can help us with our businesses, our e-commerce businesses, all those kind of things that we're involved in. Oh, yes. So that is what we are going to be doing. Now, if you're watching the live stream at any point, you can obviously comment. You can say hi. Uh, and if you have a question for Richard, uh, put it in the comments, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer that for you. OK, and if, of course, if there's any technical issues, again, put it in the comments because it's always good to know if things aren't working. Right. So uh, as sometimes they do with live streams. Uh, so, yeah, so that's it. That's what we're going to do. Um, I am going to hit the intro button now. So uh, it's going to last about 30 seconds. Then I'll be back. I'm going to intro the podcast. I just wanted to give you a heads up on what's going on. Uh, so don't go anywhere. I'll be back again very, very soon. Welcome to the e-commerce podcast with Matt Edmondson, a show that brings you regular interviews, tips and tools for building your business online. Well, hello and welcome to the e-commerce podcast with me, your host, Matt Edmondson. Now, whether you are just starting out or if you're like me, you know, a bit of a dinosaur and have been around the world of e-commerce for a while, uh, it doesn't matter because my goal is simple. I just want to help you grow your e-commerce and digital businesses. And every week I get to talk to the amazing people, the amazing guests that we have on the show from the world of e-commerce. And I get to ask them all kinds of questions about what they know and how it's going to help us develop online. I like to say that I try and have the conversations you would have if you got to sit down with them and have a coffee or if you're in England, a cup of tea. Uh, I'm really keen to dig into their story, learn the principles that can help us start and adapt and grow our own online businesses. OK, so if you enjoy this episode, I'd appreciate it immensely if you would uh kind of, you know, like and subscribe. Give us a rating on iTunes. If you are watching the live stream, because we do uh, broadcast out the recording of the podcast live. If you're watching live on YouTube or on Facebook, make sure you say hi. It'd be great to connect with you and meet you. And obviously subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and our Facebook channels, as well as the audio podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. OK, so that's the pitch over. Uh, but do connect with us. It's always good. Now, on this week's e-commerce podcast, I get to talk with automation expert and entrepreneur Richard Schnitzel. It's very hard for me to say. I don't know why. Richard Schnitzel. <laughs> automation uh, isn't just, you know, big corporations swapping out humans for robots. Oh, no, it is just as relevant for us as small business owners, as small business people. Uh, and we're, you know, who are using software tools every day for efficiency and productivity. And there are some hacks, there are some tips, there are some tricks that Richard is definitely going to get into. Now, he owns and operates a kind of done for you automation company, helping six figure entrepreneurs build the automation that they need to scale their businesses to seven figures and beyond. So, this is the first time. On the show, we've had someone talking specifically about automation. And let me tell you, from my own experience and running my own e-commerce businesses, automation is a game changer when you get it right. So you're definitely going to want to grab your notebooks, as they say. 
Okay. Now, as I said, if you are watching this on the live stream, you can obviously throw questions in the comments as we go through, and I will try and put those questions to Richard. Uh, all of the notes from today's show will be available uh, for free. You can grab them uh, if you're not making notes yourself for whatever reason, you know. Uh, just head on over to our website, ecommercepodcast.net. <laughs> Let me start that again, ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 58. Okay, so that's the URL that you want to go to, ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 58. Now, before I bring our guest onto the screen uh, and start chatting with Richard, I just want to play you a quick video from John Tilly, who uh, he will explain. He was back with us in episode 50. This is a quick message from John. Great. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. Uh, John was a great guest and he's got a fantastic platform. So if you do want to know and understand the whole Amazon thing, do check it out. Do check out zongguru.com. It's a great little platform. I've had a little sneak peek myself and I can't, I can't, I can't say I've seen anything better. I'm not going to lie. So do check it out. Have a look at what John has done and get in touch with him. Listen to episode number 50 if you've not heard about it already and you want to get into Amazon. He really shared some amazing stuff there. So do check out John and connect with him. Now, if you are watching the video, you will see in the corner of your screen a URL. That's right, ecommercepodcast.net forward slash conference 2021. What's that all about, I hear you say? Well, head on over to the URL and you will find out because uh, it's the e-commerce conference 2021. Uh, and I'm one of the panelists at that conference alongside people like Chloe Thomas, who's been on the e-commerce podcast before. Uh, there is a big conference going on. I think it's the 14th, 15th of Feb, some, uh, Feb. We've gone through February. It's April, not February, April. Uh, go and check out the website uh, and go register and go join us. Uh, at, come join us at the conference. It'd be great to meet you. Come ask your questions. They have got some amazing keynote speakers talking about all things to do with e-commerce. It's going to be great. It's going to be super exciting. So do check that out. E-commerce uh, podcast.net forward slash conference 2021. It's obviously all going to be online. Uh, given the world in which we live. And so, I mean, you know, there are some good things and some bad things about the pandemic. And one of them is because all these conferences are now online, you don't have to travel anywhere. It's super easy to attend and get involved. So do check it out, ecommercepodcast.net forward slash conference 2021. Okay, I think that's enough from me. Uh, let's bring on to the show tonight's guest, like I say, Richard Schnitzel, uh, and we're going to be talking about all things automation. And uh, Richard, let's bring you on. Richard, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great, man. It's great that you could be here. Now, when we were, we were talking just before we went live on air, just to sort of have a quick catch up, and you're beaming in all the way from... Well, I'm going to say sunny Connecticut because that's just my assumption. But actually, is it sunny? It is not sunny today. It is. Oh, wow. Uh, but we were in a streak of sun. So if you were 25 hours earlier, you would have been spot on. Oh, OK. OK. Now it's just like England. What? Cold, gray and wet, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. OK. As long as I'm not on my own. I went for a walk earlier on in the park and um, man alive. You know, we're in March. We're, we're rapidly approaching April and it was freezing. I was so cold. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> Still, yes. never mind. 35 degree rain, just warm enough to be rain, not cold enough to get the snow and the enjoyment of actually seeing it. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, you know, we're entering spring, so hopefully things will get better. It's coming. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, listen, let's get into uh, the, the whole automation thing. And before we get into maybe the tips and tricks uh, and uh, the examples that we're going to get into, 
how did you end up in automation? I mean, did you were you just sat there at school one day and thought, you know, I'm just going to be an automation expert? Is that kind of how it happened, or is there probably a, a bit more, a bit more thought? Yeah, there's a that? little bit more to that. Uh, <laughs> so, I I have a degree in mechanical engineering, so I have an incredibly logical mind just based off of the training and the schooling that I went through to get my degree. Sure. And I have a lifelong passion with tech. You know, I'm. I'm the IT person for my entire family because I'm the one that gets it the most. Uh, and when I, I know started how that feels. to, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. I'm feeling <laughs> your pain right there. There's a whole bunch of people that just heard that comment who are going, "Yeah, we feel your pain, brother. We do." Sorry, Richard. I interrupted you. Carry on. <laughs> no, not at all. So when I was starting my business and I was trying to figure out, you know, what I was going to do with it. Uh, I actually, I didn't start in automation at all. I started in uh, messenger bots using ManyChat, who I know you talked to very recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we had on last week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I started there because I liked the tech and I liked what it could do, but I quickly found out that I am terrible at writing copy. Uh, it is not <laughs> good. Like, just can't do it. Yeah, hands up uh, who didn't see that one come in, a mechanical engineer, right, yeah. not, not very good. Yeah, at it, it comes out like a lab report, like, you know, very <laughs> rigid, like bullet points, do this, then this. People read it and go like, that's great, Rich, but I don't know what the heck you're talking about, like, and they move on, right? So it's yeah, terrible they know at the what to do, part. they're just not inspired, right? That's just the way yes. it yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I was really good at was figuring out how to make messenger bots do really cool things from a tech perspective. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, when I would build them and somebody else would see that and go, oh, that's really cool. I'd like to do that too. I could explain to them how to get from point A to point B in a way that they could understand. Mm -hmm. And doing that and then going, okay, I'm good at that piece. Why don't I do more of that? I followed that path into now I have conversations with people every day about what they're doing in their business. and. Mm -hmm having a similar conversation of, okay, you're using you know, WooCommerce and HubSpot as your CRM and you need the two of them to talk to each other. Here's a couple different options that are possible from a technology standpoint. And here's how it's going to affect your business and how you can use it to have a benefit. And because I can have that conversation in like normal human speak instead of a strictly technical jargon level, they yeah. can begin to understand what's going on so they can have confidence to say, oh, yes, okay, that's really cool. I want to do that in my business. And then because of my tech background, I can then go build it for them. So they just have to see the vision, understand that that's the direction they want to go, and then say, yes, Rich, you know, let's move forward. And I, I can hand them a, a nice okay. project in a package. So... um. Well, it's interesting the, the, the kind of journey that you went on then. I mean, when you finished your degree in mechanical engineering, did you just start your business straight away? Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? No, I, I worked in a bunch of different businesses for 10 years. I started okay. in construction management. I did estimating. I did field sales where I traveled all over the world uh, to uh, install gearboxes and power plants the size of you know a room. I did engineering sales. Uh, and I, in all of those businesses, it was always with a, a small company firm or smaller firm where I always had a direct line to the president or the owner and I kept my ears open. So my professional career before this you know, built a catalog in my brain of things to do and things not to do and just different experiences in business that mm -hmm. I've stored away so that I can now draw on that to build my own business. And you know, I started because I, I reached a point where I had all these ideas and something would happen in you know, my last company. I'd be like, you know, I would have done that differently. Mm -hmm. If this was my company, I would have done that differently. And I kept having that thought and I kept having that thought. And then yeah, yeah. finally I reached a point where you know I said, you know what, I should probably just start my own company because I've now reached a point where my mindset is completely different. Like I, I'm not yeah. just a worker anymore. I want to build something yeah, uh, and that, that forced me to you know, start what is now you know, my automation business. Yeah. It's really interesting how, how um, your journey is. Again, it just resonates. I think so many people listening will go, yeah, that was me, you know, that I was working this one job and I, 
I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something better. And I felt like I wouldn't do it this way if this was my company. And that thought really starts to take seed in people's heads, don't they? And they start to think about the possibility of running their own company. So how old were you, if you don't mind? I know this is not what we're talking about. I'm just curious. But um, how old were you when you decided, you know what, enough's enough. And I'm, I'm going to take the plunge and do it myself. Uh, let's see. I am 34. I started three years ago. So I started my business at 31. Uh, okay. And it was probably a solid year, year and a half before that, that I did not take the plunge where I was had that idea in the back of my head that I, ca- I kept ignoring and, sure. and pushing to the side. Uh, but yeah, 31. <laughs> That's really interesting. And did you, when you launched it, were you kind of, were you one of these guys that did the, the side hustle? You kind of did a bit of work, a bit of company, or did you just go full in from day one? I went full in. Oh, wow. Took yeah, the plunge, I, the leap of faith. I took the plunge. Wow. Yeah, I was. And so, I was, and did it work for you straight away, or did you did you find actually it was a bit of a struggle for a while? Yeah, it was a bit of a struggle for a while. Uh, you know, I was fortunate that I had enough savings when I started mm-hmm. that I had. You know, I, I bet my nest egg so that we could start this. So I had funds to struggle through that, and I made that decision as a personal choice because I knew if. I didn't go all in. I wouldn't give it the amount of effort that it needed to become something real. Mm -hmm. So I I needed that, you know, sink or swim aspect of doing this for me to really excel at what's going on. But yeah, it was, it was a struggle. Like I think it is for most people, you know, like I said, I started out doing something that I had now have no aspect of my business is about building messenger bots and writing copy. It was the wrong thing for me to do. And I, I had to follow a path over you know, the first year and a half, two years of going, okay, I did this project that worked well. This didn't work mm-hmm. well. What did I enjoy? Okay. Let's pivot a little bit to the left. Okay. Do this project. Ah, eh, that was yeah. too much of a correction. Let's pivot a little bit back to the yeah, right yeah. and you know, finding my path to land up where I am now, which interestingly enough, I think is a, the story of a lot of the people that I work with. You know, you, you start doing yeah, something, you hit it right. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, people start paying you, and then you look back and you go, "Wow, I, I'm doing this. I'm getting paid for this. How did I get here?" Where it's just a, it's a <laughs> series of decisions. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. a series of decisions along that way that lead mm-hmm. you to this point, and that journey yeah. is is really yeah, fun. I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah. trade that for anything, even no, with all excellent. the that's excellent. sleepless nights and you know, <laughs> yeah, hours worried. worked. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. Right. It's, it's yeah. interesting, like you say, so many, I was talking to a friend today, this very day, we were talking about, I was talking with him, and he felt a little bit kind of, um, I'm going to use the word stuck um, in life, and it's kind of like, my, my counsel, for whatever it was worth, was, I wonder actually if you just need to make a decision, do you know what I mean, and just mm-hmm. start doing something, uh, because it's always easier to turn a car that's moving, do you know what I mean, is my theory, it's, it's very yeah. difficult to turn something that's stationary. I appreciate this is not true for everybody in their circumstances, but your story is very much like that. Let's just start. We're going to start here with the many chat thing. And then we're going to, the trendy word is pivot, isn't it? We're going to pivot as we go along. I I have an issue with that word. I'm not going to lie. But anyway, um, that's a personal thing. Uh, But that's what, in fact, what you did, isn't it? You kind of, you started going in one direction. And actually, as you were doing that, you you eventually settled into this niche of automation. And that's work. Well, it's working for you, I take it. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Wow. So for any would be entrepreneurs out there listening to the show who are thinking of starting your business, it's, I just find it fascinating listening to other people's stories in terms of how they got started in business. And um, yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that. So here yeah. we are three years later. Um, or Sorry, 18 is it 18 months, three years later. Um, and you're 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 kind of heading up this whole automation thing. So what does a typical day look like for you um, in, in this business? Uh, well, for me, you know, my role in the company is building the workflows and helping people understand what's going on. So my day revolves around having those conversations about you know, what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and laying out, I whiteboard a lot of mm-hmm. laying out, okay, we're going to start with something that happens in your business. You know, Somebody purchases a product on your website. And we need to add them to an email marketing campaign to nurture them. We need to add them to your CRM so we can track their purchase. And maybe we need to you know, do an offline conversion for your 
Facebook pixel so you can improve your ad sequence. Yeah. And so my basic day is having those types of conversations with entrepreneurs so I can pull out of them what's really going on in their business and I can offer those solutions. And then from there, I have an amazing team that can implement on that vision that we create. Uh, yeah. So the, the latter part of my day is you know, working with them and making sure that they're they're on track. They have all their answers, their questions answered, and you know, they, they have the information and the tools they need to mm -hmm. you know, build on what I've handed them as a workflow. So the, you, you, I like what you said there, because I, I think actually there's a lot of value in just in just having the conversation with entrepreneurs in terms of figuring out what it is you're actually doing. And and that that kind of clarity is not, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, John, I'm kind of going to take the assumption that actually people don't come to you with that kind of clarity. And so you, you have to tease it out of them. You have to understand what it is. And I imagine there's quite a lot of value just in a business owner creating that kind of clarity on a whiteboard. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if I have somebody come to me, then they have an idea. They have a start of an idea that usually comes out of a pain point in their business. Mm -hmm. Something that they're doing that's taking them six hours a week. And they're like, you know what? If I can solve this, I don't care what the cost is. I just want this to be fixed. Right. And, and they don't have the solution. They don't have the complete scenario, but they have enough of a framework to know, okay, this is something I think we can probably automate. Let's have a conversation and see what the possibilities are. And the biggest aspect of that is having that conversation with another human. Mm -hmm. I, I tell people, you know, even if you're not having it with me, have it with somebody else in your team. And the old saying that if you can teach somebody to do something, you truly know it translates really well to figuring out a workflow in your business. If you can yeah. teach somebody how to do something that you need done, then you truly know what's going on. And that's the first step to being able to apply automation to it. You know, automation is a multiplier. If yeah. the process is good, it's going to make it great. But if there's a hole, all automation is going to do is shine a spotlight on that hole <laughs> okay. and make it a glaring problem in what's going yeah. on. So you need to make sure that that logical flow of what you want to have happen is solid and truly what you want to have happen. That's a really interesting point. Automation is a multiplier. I like that. It's just going to highlight something that's good. It's also going to highlight something that's bad. And so you yes. need to be really clear on the workflows. So if I'm, I'm sort of sit here, sitting here listening to you, um, if I'm sort of a, a a new guy who's just starting out, um, is automation something that is as a, as a does that apply to me, or is that specifically um, people that have maybe been in business for a while and they've got multiple processes going on? I think it applies to every everybody. I think the difference is if you're just starting out, the scope of what you're trying to achieve is going to be smaller. Mm -hmm. right? So. At the very least, if you're just starting out, you know, take all of your purchases and add them to a master Google Sheet so that you can track them and you can do you know, data analysis in the next three months to figure out what's happening. You don't need to then go to your Facebook pixel and go to the next step and the next. You don't need a 10 sequence automation. But if, you're, if you just do one step, you can then build on that afterwards. I think one of the biggest challenges I see is people try to automate their entire business in one single thought, right? And it's too much information. Sure. The, the challenge is to bring it down into a logical flow that makes sense. And if you're starting out and the only thing you know is that you want to track your data, then that's fine. Automate that. And then at some point, you will start doing something manually after that gets added to the Google Sheet. And you go, you know what? I'm now doing this the same way every mm -hmm. day. Maybe I should now tack that onto the automation that I built last month. Yeah. And that process will repeat again. In another month, you'll go, okay, now that's automated. And now because that's automated and I have more time to do the things that matter in my business, I've now figured this next piece out. And now I'm doing this piece and I'm doing this the same way every time. Maybe I can tack that on to the automation. Yeah. And it's like building blocks. Okay. You just stack them on top of each other. So you, you, what you're talking about here is it's an, 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 
iterative process, isn't it? It's like, let's start here, let's figure this bit out, then figure out what the next key thing is we should solve and do it a step at a time and not try and, you know, take the mountain all in one go. Um, yeah. And that, that applies whether you're starting out or that applies whether you've been in business for a long time. Now, one of the things that you said, which you kind of brushed over, but I'm going to pick up on uh, if I may. Um, so if you're just starting out, you said that, you know, at the very least you should do is just take the data, the sales data and put it in a Google sheet. Right. Mm-hmm. And then carried on, you know, and do some data analysis. And that just kind of rolled off the tongue there, Richard. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> so why? What are the benefits of me as a new business? And why would I want to put all of my sales debt? It might sound like an obvious question, but let me ask the obvious question. Yeah. and Hopefully it'll be clear. Um, why would I want to put all my sales data in a Google sheet? Because. Whether you don't have to be looking at your data on a day-to-day basis, but having it in a single location informs your decisions. Mm-hmm. And like we were talking about of just you know getting the car moving, if in three months you want to make a decision to change your business and you don't have any data with which to make that decision, your car isn't moving yet. Mm-hmm. So you're stuck making an assumption about what's going on. And dumping it to a Google sheet because of the way that sheets work is you can put in all of the information, right? You don't need to pick and choose going, well, do I need to know, you know, their first name and last name? Do I need to know their email? Do I need to know, you know, the price of the product that they purchased? Do I need, Mm -hmm. who cares? Put it in, just Just put it in, dump it all in there. Right. And then when you go back, at least it's there and you can hide a bunch of columns. So, you know, if you just want to look at their names, you can just look at their names, but you need the data in order to inform those decisions that you make next. Mm-hmm. And if it's not there, it, you know, you're know starting from square one, three months into yeah. the ball game. No, I like that. So actually for automation then, one of the things that we wanna do quite quickly is start to gather data um, and start to make informed decisions. And if you're starting out, and if even if you're new to, you know, not new to this whole business, again, putting your, I, the, the idea of putting your sales data in a Google sheet makes an awful lot of sense to me. I mean, an awful lot of sense. So how how easy is that to automate? Now, I appreciate I don't know everything about every e-commerce platform that's out there, but what are some, maybe what's the common way to, that you would think about approaching something like that? Uh, so that single step, we build it in Zapier, which is a no-code automation solution. Uh, we use it all the time for our clients. Mm-hmm. You set up a, a trigger, which is you know the thing that happens that then, needs to result in an action. And, you know, if you're using WooCommerce, you do a a payment new purchase in WooCommerce, you could do it with Stripe, you could do it with PayPal, you could do it with Shopify. All the major brands have some form of a, you know, I received money trigger with a bunch of information attached to that of what was purchased, who was purchased, when they were purchased, how much, and all of those line items. And then the next step is you create a, a Google sheet, you create a tab on it that you label the tab purchases and you create columns starting in A and going out as far as you want. I think mm-hmm. you know, Google Sheets goes out to several thousand columns, which you will never need. So there's plenty of space. <laughs> yeah, it's more than you need. And I've never cre- filled them up yet, so no. And create a column for each data point that is there and you want to track and then you map it. So you'd say, okay, this point, I want to go to column A this mm-hmm. I want to go to column B, this I want to go to column C. And then you turn it on, you just let it sit there. And then every time you get a purchase, it'll automatically show up in your Google Sheet account. And so literally you're taking something like Zapier, which is a well-known established sort of system that's out there. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you're connecting that with your e-commerce platform, certainly the most common one. So we'll take Shopify. There'll be a Zapier integration with Shopify. Um, and Zapier in effect sits as the the go between between Shopify and the Google Sheet, and it sends the data over to Google Sheets when a transaction happens. Have I understood that right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, so you mentioned that you use Zapier a lot. Uh, is that is that a a, a, de- a deliberate choice? Is it the only thing out there that really does what it does? It, what why do you use that a lot? I started my business using Zapier. Uh, mm-hmm. And I do think that they are one of the best out there from two perspectives. One, the way that they present the automations from within their program, mm-hmm. uh, I find that everybody can understand. So when I build something, I can record a Loom video 
and walk somebody through, okay, this is what we built. This is how we build it. This is what's going sure. on. And it allows you to have a, a base level of understanding of what you're putting in place in your business. So that's you know the front end aspect. The back end aspect is they also allow me as a developer to build on top of their program when things don't exist. Um, you know, so one of the things that doesn't exist for, I think it's Shopify has a fulfillment aspect of it, mm -hmm. but you can't put in the shipping ID into Shopify through Zapier, but you can through Shopify's API, which mm -hmm. is the language that Shopify uses to talk to other programs. Mm -hmm. So we built a custom program that allows that connection to happen. I'm with so, you. So using Zapier allows me to start with 80% of the puzzle already built. And then the last 20% that's unique to the business that I'm working with, we can create something custom for them that will then complete that, that journey that we're trying to take them on. That's a really, really useful point. So um, let me just echo back what I've just heard, just so it's really clear. Um, for 80% of the automation tasks, Zapier is a good place to start and getting your head around Zapier and how it connects with the different pieces of software, with the Shopify, Google Sheets or whatever, that's really, really good. Now I use Zapier, I have all kinds of things that kind of go on. Um, and I think it's quite fascinating. Now, if we, if, if, if Zapier doesn't have what it needs, this is where it starts to get a little bit more involved, isn't it? So you use the phrase API. So um, this is where you, you know, you, you kind of, you, you write a program in effect, you write your own mini version of Zapier mm -hmm. um, to integrate with the, the different programs. Just to explain to people listening, if they don't know what an API is, what an API is. Uh, that's a really yeah. crazy way to sure. word that question, sure. but you know what I mean. API is application programming interface. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's like a language. So the way that we're talking in English right now, API is a language that programs can use to have a conversation between each other when they may or may not have the same first language. So mm -hmm. my first name language is English, but maybe I need to be speaking Spanish because that's the common language between us. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was traveling, I spent a lot of time in France and the common language between uh, French people and people who spoke English oftentimes was German. Okay. Because I was in the Alsace region, which is right mm -hmm. next to Germany. So mm -hmm. API is like being able to speak German when somebody speaks French and when somebody speaks English. It's this okay. common language that both people understand that then they get it go, okay, you told me that to me in German. Now right. I'm going to translate it into my you know, preferred language, which is English. And I'm going to do what you asked me to do. Mm -hmm. That's really, really good. So the API then allows one website that talks one language to talk to another website that maybe talks another language and send data back and forth. Um, exactly. With the help of a little program that you guys could could create or anybody could create really um, if, you, if you know what you're doing. So uh, like most things on the web these days, there's some software out there you can use to help you with most of it. But if you can't get what you need, you can genuinely program your way around most things uh, and you, you get in specialist help that can help you do that automation. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, if I back up a little bit, you, one of the things that you, one of the phrases you used, which I thought was, was, was fascinating, um, was a lot of the time people start off with a pain point. There's a pain point in their business, right? So what are some of the common pain points that you see that we should be aware of if we've got an e-commerce business um, that we can kind of start to think, this is an area I should now think about automation in? Uh, so one pain point a lot is leads when you're getting so many leads and then there's mm -hmm. some manual tracking process that you need to do before they, you can do something with that lead. Okay. Um, another one we see a lot is after somebody purchases, there's a lot of manual things that need to happen. You know, it, once the purchase is done yeah. and a lot of in that, there's also a lot of like customer nurturing and customer follow-up that needs to happen to complete a good customer experience. Yeah that tends to start really manually because you have the idea of, you know, like, okay, somebody just sent, bought this product. Maybe I should send them a quick email to, you know, explain to them how the best way to use it and to congratulate them on purchasing it and, you know, give them a link to a couple other things that people also 
usually purchase, right? Yeah. You have that idea, you send it manually, and then all of a sudden that's working and you getting, you know, even at 20 purchases a day, right? Now all of a sudden that's 20 extra emails that you need mm -hmm. to send or your VA needs to spend. And now they're spending, you know, four hours a week sending manual emails to clients mm -hmm. that how do I get them to stop that so that my VA can then focus on that last 10% of people who really need to talk to? Sure. Sure. Okay. So we've got lead generation. It tends to be one, the sort of after purchase or post purchase, the post purchase sequences and stuff we, we tend to call them. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the pain points do you come across? The, going back to the data is a, a common one where, mm -hmm. you know, There'll be a bunch of stuff going on and you'll have a bunch of data in your Shopify store about purchases. You'll have a bunch of data in your CRM about your lead funnel to get people to do a purchase. And then you'll have a bunch of data in a Google sheet about you know, where you ship stuff out to, but they live in different silos. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to make a decision and instead of it all being in one spot, you're doing like a quick alt tab between three different windows on your computer <laughs> trying to like, remember, was that $1,010 on the 13th or was that $1,020 on the 15th? Well, you know, like, yeah. and you're just, your mind's going crazy because you're trying to make these connections and because they're in different silos, you, it's making it more difficult. You're concentrating so much on finding the data that you don't have enough brain power left over to think about the data and do a, make a decision off of it. You're getting mm -hmm. task saturated by the experience. So that's definitely a, a pain point as well of, of pulling all of those information data points into one spot so that you can see it and respond to it effectively. Uh, okay. And then I'd say one of the other big ones is notifications of when things go wrong. Ooh, because okay right i'm listening <laughs> yeah you know hopefully 90 percent of what's going on in your business doesn't have a problem but then there's that last 10 percent where something doesn't happen quite the way that it's supposed to right mm -hmm. and it usually starts with something really innocuous like the ups website was really slow and you didn't get to the last two shipments of that day so it went to monday and then Monday rolls around and you forgot about it because you weren't in work for two days. And then all of a sudden it's Thursday and those haven't gone out and you've got three angry emails from people because they haven't gotten the tracking information. They expected the product on Tuesday and they're, you know, cussing your poor assistant out on the, the mm -hmm. phone, trying to find out what's going on. Automation is a great tool to catch those things because you have great action points that are supposed to happen. You're supposed to have a purchase then you're supposed to have, you know, even if it's the purchase goes to a Google sheet and then somebody's supposed to type in what the tracking number is as a record of what they did and then you know, add it in and ship it out. If in three days that cell with the tracking number still is blank, add it to an email that shows up in your inbox at 8 a.m. in the morning with a big important flag on it that mm -hmm. says you've got three shipments that you should go track down and find out what's going on. Wow. Wow. Okay. And that, I mean, is that complex to build? You've got a few things going on there. Is that relatively straightforward? It's not simple, but it's not complex. I'd say that's about middle of the road because there are any time that you have multiple triggers interacting with the same system starts to up the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, but the logic between all of those is pretty simple, right? It's a, it's a purchase with a record in a Google sheet. It's, that record would have a date of purchase in it. Mm -hmm. And then it would be a daily trigger to look at that Google sheet and find any cell who where that date is three days ago. And if in that cell, that uh, shipping value column is blank, send an email. Mm -hmm. right. So logically step that's, it's simple, but uh, it gets complex when you have to pull in the details and that's where it's yeah. important to have that conversation with somebody and whiteboard it out so that you can, you know, uh, find the data. I heard somebody say the details are in the commas, <laughs> right? The details are in the commas. It's the, there so that many logic flow sounds really, going, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's so true. The details are in the commas. I like that. Um, so that, um, 
that automation that you talked about there, the sort of the, I like the idea, the, the idea of somebody sending me an email if a product has not got a tracking number after three days post-purchase. Is that something that you tell Google Sheets to do? Is that something that Google Sheets can do? Or is that something that you program in Zapier? I appreciate it's a bit macro here, uh, micro, but it, I'm just curious to know what, what you're using where in this kind of thing. If that's all we're doing, it, w- it could live in Zapier. Right. Uh, it can live in Google Sheets if we need to do something a little bit more complex on top of that, like maybe mm-hmm. go into a Google Drive and you know pull out a, a file or uh, the record isn't just in one line. Maybe we need to go check another sheet at the same point and double check the data points. Yeah, That's something that we would offload into Google Sheets and write something custom to handle that because based off of the way that Zapier works, at some point, what you're doing might become too inefficient from a task usage standpoint, Mm -hmm. where doing that logic would take us 15 steps in Zapier where we could just write a simple code script and it's done in two seconds and you're you're saving your task usage for what's really important. Yeah, that's really good. Well, there's some great examples there in terms of how to use automation to help you, you know, with your e-commerce business, to help you run your e-commerce business. So we've talked about leads, we've talked about post-purchase, talked about data management, and we've talked about, you know, notifications when things go wrong. And they are going to go wrong. So do get notified yes. of them. I like that. That's great. So I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm kind of listening to the podcast and I'm thinking, this is great. I can... I, I've definitely got a few pain points in my business or I'm starting out. I'm definitely going to try shoving the data into Google Sheets. I've got my Shopify site. Yep. Why would I not? Um, I, so I've got in my head a few pain points. What, what you know, in terms of this process where you do the clarification, you whiteboard, you map things out. Where do I start now as the business owner in terms of I now want to solve a problem? What's the, what's the process? How do I sort of get rolling with that in a way that's going to help me? Yeah, so I I would do three steps. One is write down where you're where you're starting. What's the thing that happens in your business that then causes a bunch of stuff to happen? Okay. And then what's the outcome that you want after all that stuff happens? And those are your two bookends of what you're going to build your automation between. Okay. The next step is to write down your assumptions about your bookends because a lot of us, when we're talking about something in our business, because we do it every day and because we've been doing it for so long, we forget that there are certain aspects about making that decision or about why that trigger is supposed to happen that we're not communicating or thinking about. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to build out your automation, you need to make sure that you're aware of what those are because they may influence the decisions you make about the stuff that happens in the middle. So I like to tell people, ask yourself why, like pretend you're having a conversation with a small child that's you know saying, well, we need to go to the grocery store. Well, why? Because we're out of food. Well, why? Because we ate dinner the past three nights and we don't have any more food. You know, so you don't yeah. have to go ad nauseum, but at least that prompt will help you go, oh, okay, yeah, we have to go to the grocery store because we have no food. But to me, I've been shopping for, you know, well, not 35 years, but most of my adult <laughs> life, right? I just automatically know that we're out of food. I got to go to the grocery store. That assumption may be something that you're making with your business as well. And you need to make sure that you're aware of that. So mm-hmm. bookends, simplify them, write down your assumptions. And then to figure out that stuff in the middle is when you have that conversation with somebody else and you explain to them how you're going to get from point A to point B. Okay. And And you work it through with them. Yeah. You work it through with them and that allows Mm -hmm. them to ask you questions about well, why are you doing it that way? You know, but you've said Dave has to do this task three times and he never does it. Why is it going to Dave? Why does he have to do it? And why do you think that he never gets to it? Oh, right. Those questions will help you go, well, Dave really doesn't need to do it. I just gave it to him three months ago and I never changed it. This could actually go to a Google sheet and then he doesn't have to remind me. I can go to the Google sheet. Okay, cool. That's the first step in my process. And that conversation will pull out those aspects that 
are what somebody's doing right now because they started out doing it, but they don't they no longer need to because of the true workflow that's going on. I I, I call it fixing the highway instead of the detour. Right? We've okay. all had to take a, a back road sometimes because there's a, a road construction. So you start taking a detour to get to work. Mm-hmm. And then you try to fix the detour because there's potholes in the detour. Where really you need to go back to the highway and fix the highway so you can actually do what you were supposed to be doing the best way possible and ignore the detour completely. Yeah, that's such good advice. Especially because over the long long term, you'll have, you have you kind of adapt and change so many times. You, do you know what I mean? Right. And those those systems, those ways of doing things become quite cumbersome, but it's just the way you've always done them. Well, it's for the last five years, you've done them this way because it's kind of right. evolved. Whereas if you took a step back today and was, you know, was going to start again or a friend came to you and said, how should I do this? You wouldn't tell them to do what you do. You would tell them to do it this way because this way makes much more sense. And so what you're saying is challenge those assumptions uh, and figure out the, the best way to, to do that for you. Yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Well, it's good to know that I've got this down right. So, um, so uh, I've got here. Check your bookend. So, understand where you're starting. Understand where you want to end up. Um, mm-hmm. Understand the assumptions that you're making in that whole process, and then get somebody's input on how you plan to get from A to B, so that they can challenge you, stretch your thinking. Um, and ask you maybe a few awkward questions about why it is that you're doing that. And so by that point, have I then got a roadmap that I can use for automation? Yes. Is that the plan? Yeah. Yeah. The plan is by that point, you then have a set of things that need to happen that you can then go to a program like Zapier and mm-hmm. you know search out those programs and start to build out a, a sequence of events that'll just happen based off of that, you know, that first bookend occurring in your business. Yeah. And one of the things that you said that I really liked, um, that this whole automation thing is very digital. You know, this is computers doing what they need to do and automating these processes. But it starts out on something very analog, a whiteboard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, th- I find that quite fast. You see, I still I still write, as many viewers will know, uh, I still write on paper as we, as we take notes here and, and sort of go through things. And there's something about the initial part of this process, just working it out with a pen and paper or a marker on a whiteboard, right? And just mm-hmm. hashing it out and hashing the design out before you even jump into technology. Have you found, because I know for me, right, if I join, you know, Zapier, the first thing I want to do is go and play and just, you know, just have a little, <laughs> just start yeah. to create the, the, some shiny object type of thing. Um, I, it's, it's, it's this whole taking a step back and planning the process, which is so sensible and so obvious, but so many times we don't do it and we just jump straight into yet another, another digital thing to help us with yet another digital problem. Uh, and mm-hmm. before you know it, we're in this sort of rabbit maze type thing. Is this something that you've experienced that you've learned over time to do it this way? Yes. Yeah. This has been you know, part of that three year journey of trial by error of you know, making this process better with other people's businesses and my own business. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I, my business is going through the same process every day, every week. I'm still getting better at you know, having this own conversation with what I'm doing. It's mm-hmm. it, it's not something that I'm immune to. It's just some, something that I've noticed because I have the conversations with other people and it's always a personal challenge for me to you know, practice what I teach and what I say because <laughs> you know, I I, feel I still get again. called on <laughs> I still get called on it by my team all the time mm. you, know, uh, you know saying something and telling them to do something and then completely ignoring that advice when I'm <laughs> doing it in my own business. Well, this was actually this leads me nicely onto my to my next question. How do you use automation in your own business? I mean, you're, you, it's not like you're running an e-commerce business as such, but obviously, um, if I was to say to you from your business point of view, what's one thing that you've automated that you kind of think that has been an absolute stroke of genius? I would do that again. I, I love my lead process. I put a lot mm-hmm. of effort into making that smoother and less frictionless or more frictionless Mm -hmm. for people who are trying to work with me. And that's based off, you know, when you come to me as a new lead, you get a a link to a calendar invite to have a call with me. 
if you don't book that call, we have a couple automated follow-ups. I have a manual follow-up from my VA at mm -hmm. a certain, I think you get a couple automated emails and you get a personal email just to check in. Uh, once you book the call, you go into a different sequence where you get the expectations of the call, how to make the call you know, really good for you, what to expect. Once the call ends, there's a, a sequence of emails you know, uh, offboarding you from that experience. If you get a proposal, there's a set of automations that I use to tell my team that a new proposal is required. Mm -hmm. And then again, another, another set of emails. I get a notification, I think three days after a proposal go, goes out in my Asana task board to have a phone call with the person if they haven't accepted the proposal yet, just to check in, make sure there aren't mm -hmm. any other questions. Once they accept, so in each sequence, there's a task that follows a, a life cycle of you know new lead, booked call, having the call. At each point, all of the information that we gather from you at that point gets pulled into the Asana task. Mm -hmm. Like when you book a call, there's a couple questions I ask you. Those get pulled into the Asana task, so I don't have to go hunt for it. I just open up my Asana. I go, oh, I'm talking to you know, Matt today. There's Matt's task. These, this is everything I know about him to date, what he wants to do, why he wants mm -hmm. to do it, all of that. And then if you get to the point where you start a project with this, that task then gets pasted into your project list. So we have this completed life cycle of everything that we've learned from you when you first came onto our radar mm -hmm. to the point where we're now working with you. And I love it because it allows my team to work really efficiently. Yeah. One of the problems I realized I had to solve was the information flow from me to the rest of my team about what's going on was really muddied. It was there, but they'd have to spend 15 minutes hunting and pecking around before yeah. they could start doing their work. So we automated that transition of all of the different steps that have to happen from a the life cycle of, of a lead to a purchase so that the information is always in one spot, regardless of which program it comes from, whether mm -hmm. it's me making personal notes, whether it's an acuity calendar link for somebody to book a call, whether it's a, a new lead coming in from someplace and we need to make the initial contact, all of that is tracked and recorded on that person's task. So mm -hmm. we always have this really good insight into what's going on. Wow. Wow. I think there's going to be many organizations listening to this going, I, I think I need to work on my lead generation process a little bit here. Um, listen, Richard, I, you know what? I say this to the guests all the time. We have amazing guests, including yourself on the show, and I feel like I, I've got so many questions. Um, and uh, But time is obviously always against us. Mm. If I'm listening to the show and I want to connect with you, want to reach out to you, maybe got some more questions for you, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, if... You know, something we've talked about has resonated with you. You can go to bowtiebots.com slash consult, and that'll take you to a link where you can book a 20-minute call with me where we can talk one-on-one -on -one about the ideas you have and how we can turn those into an automation to have a positive impact on your business. Fantastic. So that URL again was bowtiebots.com forward slash consult. You got it. Wow, I remember that well. Now, for those of you listening to the podcast, you're going to be going, what, what, bow tie, what? <laughs> those of you watching the video will uh, will understand what's going on. You, Every time that we've talked, you're always wearing a bow tie, right? Is this yep. a deliberate, I mean, it's obviously a deliberate thing. Is this part of your branding? Is that why you do this? Yeah, it is part of my branding. It. Uh, I'm a nerd, so I like Doctor Who. Okay. And Doctor Who has the famous line, bow ties are cool. <laughs> so that's part of it, right? Um, and I started wearing bow ties because of that, you know, six years ago uh, when I started my business that just really resonated with me. And I love the history of bow ties. Okay. It's it's a lost kind of knowledge of, you know, back in the day when wearing a suit and tie was common. Like you, you didn't go out in jeans and a t-shirt, you wore a suit mm -hmm. and a tie. Mm -hmm. But if you worked in a factory, you couldn't wear a long tie because it could get caught in the machinery and sure. you'd, you'd have a serious accident. So the workaround was a bow tie. Um, and you know, I love that part because I 
I love mechanics. I love working on my car. Like that's mm -hmm. always resonated with the mechanical engineer part of me. And there's so many other instances of that in, you know, professions, you know, people in museums always wear them because they can lean over artwork mm -hmm. and stuff and the tie doesn't brush the artwork, but all of those instances of the, the utility of it, it has this really nice aspect to me. And yeah, just the, the nerd in me loving bow ties yeah, yeah, are yeah. cool. And bow ties are cool according to making that a part of my life. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's well, that so now that will make sense if you're just listening to the audio version of this podcast, why it's called bow tie bots. Uh, say, Hey, listen, Richard, uh, Thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show. I've really, really appreciated it. It's uh, been great to get to know you. I have pages of notes, um, uh, which we're going to get into with the team, as we always do. Every Friday we have a team meeting following the podcast where we chat about things that we all learned from the podcast. Uh, so listen, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Super, super grateful. Uh, and no doubt we'll have you on again uh, at some point in the future. But for now, thank you so, so much. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thanks a lot, Richard. Bye for now. Wow. I, I like that. You know what? Uh, a self-proclaimed nerd. You don't get many self-proclaimed nerds coming on your podcast. I'm not going to lie. And that was just fun. The bow tie, everything was just fun. And it's good to talk to a nerd about all things automation because they're the kind of people you want to talk to about this kind of stuff. So Richard was brilliant, wasn't he? Super, super generous with his time, super generous with his knowledge. Uh, do reach out to him. Uh, and connect with him if you've got any more questions you want to understand how automation maybe can help your business or if there's follow-on questions you'd like to know the answers to i'm sure richard would more than love to connect with you and uh, and help you out uh, all of the links that richard mentioned zapier his um, bowtiebots.com all of those we will put in the show notes okay uh, so if you're driving if you are unable to take notes at the moment don't panic just go to ecommercepodcast.net forward slash 58 for all of the transcripts and notes. They're all free. You can download them from the website. No problem at all. Uh, it's going to be there for you. Okay. So uh, do connect with him because like I said, I really enjoyed that. I've really got a lot out of it. There are in my head, let me tell you a number of pain points that I have that I think, well, we can now solve these with automation, uh, which is great. So it's been very, very useful. So I think that's everything for me. Thanks for listening. Make sure you come back next week as I get to interview some more amazing guests, just like Richard, uh, and we get to dig into this whole digital thing an awful lot more and figure out how to grow our own online businesses. Uh, that's it from me. I'll be back again very, very soon. This is the e-commerce podcast. Bye for now. You've been listening to the e-commerce podcast with Matt Edmondson. Join us next time for more interviews, tips, and tools for building your business online.